Hello everyone and welcome to Riverside Theatre's Backstage Chat, a podcast where we get to talk to some of the talented artisans who work on our shows. Led by producing artistic director Alan D. Cornell and managing director John R. Moses, Riverside Theatre is the only professional theatre on Florida's Treasure Coast. Today I'm so happy to speak with Chris Clavelli, resident director of the Florida Repertory Theatre and director of our production of Morning After Grace. Part of the Bobby Olson series on the Wax Lack stage, Morning After Grace plays Riverside Theatre from January 30th to February 18th, one of the productions of our 23-24 season. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Oscar. Morning After Grace is your sixth production uh, here at Riverside that you've directed. Last season, you did Oleana, and a few seasons prior, you did God of Carnage, both of those took place on the wax lock stage and then you did the last romance and lost in yonkers and both of those happened on the stark stage and you reminded me that your first production here was stones in his pockets yeah. which i thoroughly loved and i'd yeah. forgotten that you directed it yeah. however um it took place on the stage while the theater was being rebuilt <laughs> yeah so in essence you were doing a play and on the other side of the wall a whole audience chamber was being yeah, built up. So I'm right. sure that was a challenge in and of itself. We tried not to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, uh, you didn't have to worry about it during a matinee performance. Yes, right. So, Morning After Grace, and we were very fortunate to talk to the cast, uh, Cynthia, Tony, and Evander, and um, they didn't want to give a lot because they're, they're, they didn't want to spoil it for the audience members to come. But what can you let us know about the play? Well, I think, uh, this spoiler alerts. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I think that what, what's most fascinating for an audience coming in to watch Morning After Grace is that these two are two, uh, it's a, I, here's a, I call it a romantic comedy for the pickleball set. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, that these two are two, uh, romantic, uh, lovers, uh, Angus and Abigail meet at a funeral home and, um, they get together and the morning after the beginning of our play, they learn some things about each other that, is act, uh, that are actually more mortifying and to Abigail who's like the Abigail is like Mary Tyler Moore she's like just think Mary Tyler Moore Beautiful. she's middle American Love. you know and uh, oh Rob she's she's middle American she's a good girl she doesn't swear she always washes her dishes she sends thank you notes and for she draws within the line she draws with and she uses script she doesn't print <laughs> and uh, she's not Catholic but there's a Catholic girl <laughs> sensibility to her uh, she she finds out some things about Angus that just horrify her hmm. and um, he he finds out some things about her that are that that push them apart. So and great, like when you think of romantic comedies, you think of when Harry met Sally. That's that's the that's yeah. probably our best uh, uh, example. And they the lovers have to get pushed far apart, which is what happens in the first five minutes of the play. And then they have to come back together again. And they go apart. They come back together again. And what I think is in it for our audience, for any audience watching a romantic comedy, but in this particular comedy it's about people in their 60s and their 70s right. so we think of romantic comedies as young pretty people but these are people with some scars these are people that have lived a life these are people that are running out of second chances so the co the romance is something that they have i think put on the back burner mm -hmm. thinking i'm too old for it mm -hmm. but that's why carrie Krim has really written a lovely play here and they do we do root for angus and 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 uh, abigail and i think that I think people want to go to the audience to watch, go to the theater to watch people suffer and somehow come out of it, and that we learn and share and grow with them. And this play does it in spades. And it takes place in a retirement community, it, but but these are still vibrant people. Yes, they're they're still going through a whole range of emotions. Um, yeah. It's cathartic in essence, but there's a lot of comedy and humor. In yes, well. The, well I think that if the play if the play wasn't um, if the play wasn't uh, as funny as it was, we'd just be we'd be sad. But uh, what Carrie has done is balanced equal parts uh, 
it's situ it's you know it has a Neil Simon punch lines for sure it's situational comedy like uh, our great situational comedies like you think about Frasier or uh, yeah think Frasier um, and but uh, and 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 the characters are so well drawn and so eccentric that just watching the characters interact with each other it's what i call a collision play there's ollie who was the ex-baseball player who uh is living a closeted life and there's abigail and angus and you throw them all together in one morning and it's it's madness it's wild but that's just i always say some plays are just like an appetizer and some are desserts this is a full meal mm. because they have real they actually tell each other the truth and sometimes it's ridiculous yeah and it's funny but we laugh because we recognize it right yeah how did you come across the play uh, I, I am the resident director of florida repertory theater in fort myers and i have been uh i was an associate artistic director for years and now i'm resident director and um uh, uh, we found Carrie's play, I think it might have been through the, the, the New Play Festival, and we did it, I think, four or five years ago. I never remember. But I directed it there on our main stage, and we just, and the audiences adored it. And then I just, I sent it to, to Atlan, and I perfect. said, I thought this was, and it is perfect. These are people you see at the Publix. Right. <laughs> you see these people at the Publix, yes. And and you do know the playwright Carrie. personally. Carrie Krim and I have been... Well, we've become friends because of this and also because she keeps sending me all these wonderful plays. And um, I'm a champion. I've got... I got Morning After Grace produced at another theater that I'm associated with, which is the Public Theater in Lewiston, Maine, and I sent it to Janet Mitchko, the producer there, and Janet did it last year. And, I've, and I have been submitting Carrie's plays around the country to attach myself to them mm. because I love her writing because I'm kind of tired of going, and, and Riverside does not do this. This is not, a, uh, <laughs> there are many theaters that are programming now and I think it's to try to teach the audience something and I'm not really I don't want to harp on anything I'd rather let people have an emotional night I go to the theater to have emotions I go to the theater to laugh and cry I go to the theater to get out of my right brain or my left brain whichever one that out is out of your day to day in my day to day and Carrie writes that she writes it's available writing and that, that that's not to diminish it in any way it's just People don't have to work to try to figure it out. She offers us what we need to entertain us in a really artful way. It's real. The characters are real. The characters are fully formed. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's. Uh, I'm thrilled. Now, this play is taking place on our wax lax stage, our more intimate stage. Right. And like I mentioned before, you've, you've done plays on the bigger stage and the more intimate stage. Um, is there a challenge to doing a play in one space over another? Well, I think I think the biggest challenge is something that Alan Cornell uh, solves before I even get attached to a play. And that is what's the right play for the right space? Mm -hmm. How big is it? Morning After Grace could get lost. And what I mean by lost is it's just too big. It's an intimate story with only three actors in one set. That really should be on the wax lax stage because it's almost in the audience's lap. Now, a, a play like, um, uh, well, when you watch the wonderful big musicals here, it's like, it's perfect. It's a Broadway, because it's a Broadway stage. It's a right. big proscenium. And, um, like you did Lost in Yonkers, and, that was a big production. Yeah, that's but right. But it fit the space. It, it, it did. Be, it did because it had seven, six characters. And when you put six people on that stage, suddenly it becomes magnified but like uh, the last romance which was a little play but it was also about opera so we kept bringing opera into it and that opera element we were able to open it up and to really give it an operatic feeling uh, with lights and sets and costumes um, so it transferred to that stage well but there uh, Alan has a keen eye for what should be in the wax lax and for me as a director i really don't direct them differently i mean sometimes my staging has to be uh, more open or it just the stage picture might have to change but the truth is the truth is the truth like i had um a teacher when we used to ask him what's the difference between uh, acting and 
uh, theater and film and he goes well crap is crap you know what I mean like if it's false it's false <laughs> it doesn't matter so I just I just always look for the truth but it's just kind of the writing that determines it and, and like I've mentioned before many people have mentioned before theater at least Riverside theater doesn't have merch it doesn't have a t-shirt, doesn't yeah. have a chair that every right. time you see it or purchase it, it reminds you of Riverside. The only thing that we can give you is an experience. Right. And which is going to give the audience member the best experience. Right. And that, like you mentioned, is is Alan's forte in figuring that out. Yeah. And with Morning After Grace, with the audience being right there, in essence, in the living room. Yeah, yes, that's right. Uh, Angus's living yeah. room. Yeah. Um, it, it will create a different dynamic. Definitely. Yes. Well, we're practically in the audience's lap, and in fact, the la we just staged the last scene yesterday, and I and I um I put that down as far as well, downstage in the theater is as close as you can get to the audience, and I that la our last romantic moment is almost in the front row. And I did that on purpose. That's what I call a close-up. Yeah. It's right. I'm not, that's not a spoiler alert. You won't even know it's happened. If, if it's done right, you won't even know it happened. Right. But it's psychologically, as a director, to push something all the way downstage is to is to really make it to really emphasize it. That's great. In Morning After Grace, you're working with a mature cast, but you've also taught at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York, as well as Pace University, Malloy College, and Florida Gulf Coast University. Do you use different muscles or different techniques when you're teaching younger performers versus directing someone who's been in the business longer? Um, yeah, you do. Directing is all really teaching. It's teaching the cast and the designers um, what your vision is, what, how you see the play, how you read it, what you think it's about what your approach is going to be and you have to you have to uh, you have to be real clear about that but to the younger actors when I direct young actors and I've done a lot of university productions is that you're also acting coaching you're coaching them because they don't have the skills in rehearsal yet to build performances they're still learning but with with a Tony and uh, Evander and Cynthia I, I don't have, I'm not I'm not coaching I'm not I'm not doing any of that I'm suggesting I'm clarifying I'm editing um, I'm I'm supporting uh, I'm those are the, the verbs that I use with the grown-ups also what I love about directing grown-ups is that I can be more um, abstract in my direction I can say it's like a piece of music or it's about it's like that last scene in the graduate like I, I Mike Nichols is my pole star and so I you know I, I have talked about Mike Nichols is directing in rehearsal because those actors who are in their 60s and 70s know Mike Nichols now if I say Mike Nichols at, at AMDA at the school the kids look at me like at what I am I'm a freak <laughs> I'm just look like their uncle yeah. their funny uncle yeah, that's right. Now, you started your career as an actor. Yeah. Um, when did you sort of move into the directing field? The directing, when, when did you start f focusing on directing? Well, it, was, it, was be it started because a friend of mine was a, is, a, is a playwright, a wonderful playwright, and Cynthia, too, who's in the show, and I, I've directed her plays as well. But they, it, was, it was of necessity because they asked me to, to direct their plays. And I kind of went, okay. And I fell into that um, while I was still acting. But really, my first love was acting. And I was pursuing it wholeheartedly in New York at the time. And this is about 25 years ago. Um, I started to direct because it started to happen and people started to ask me to do it. And, I, and, it, and then I worked with a couple of really bad directors when I was about 40 years, 35 years old. Really bad directors. And I thought, oh, come on. Somebody has to do this better. Mm -hmm. So there was a competitive edge to it. Um, and then I have kind of gotten away from acting. Uh, I just find that for me, directing uses my, I'm a, I'm a secret uh, therapist. I want to be a, I want to be a therapist. I want to <laughs> well, be a director is only yeah, the therapist. therapist. Yeah. I want to be the, I want to be the priest. I want to be the therapist. I want to be the, the football coach. 
and I and I want to be um, you know like a shaman. Um, seriously, the the roles that the director gets to play are grown up parts. It, it's better to be a grown up because you have to be in the room with people having these huge emotions and actors under enormous stress, and somehow you have to keep your head about you. Um, but I find it so much more challenging. I'm also an artist, a visual artist, and um, I love music and I love movies and I get to use all my points of reference as a director. And as an actor, it's terrific, but I, Oscar, I don't need the, uh, the love of the audience. I did need the love mm. of the audience. And I think if you stop needing the love of the audience, you're a better actor, but you kind of lose the juice you need to do it eight shows a week. And I really don't want to do it eight shows a week because sometimes I've done bad plays and when you do a bad play eight shows a week, yeah. it's existential. <laughs> so you would say that being an actor has helped in your oh, yes. directing? Oh yeah. yes, I, because the actor for me is always the star of the rehearsal, is always the star of the show. My direction needs to be seamless. My, I like my direction to be seamless and also I don't want anybody to say it was great direction. They shouldn't know it happened. It should, the show should just occur on the stage. It should, it's like what they said about Mike Nichols' direction. You never thought about Mike Nichols' direction. You just went, oh, that's right. That's how people behave. So what I learned as an actor, which was to tell the truth of the, the audience, to tell the truth of the character, and also to read the script because you, as a director, you need to read the script from about six different vantages. But I learned how to read the script from a psychological perspective as an actor, and that, and I, and I use that every rehearsal, every rehearsal. Is why does a character do what they do? That's just it for me. Why do? And it's also my thing in person, my personal life is why do I do the mistake? Why do I do make the mistakes that I have made for 60 years? <laughs> when am I going to learn? <laughs> and that's the beauty of Morning After Grace. It's right. At every stage in life, you can continue to learn and grow and, as, as a human being. That was well said. That's right. Now, here's um, uh, something that I found out. You say, or I've been told, you're a good cook. Is there uh, is there a, a favorite dish you like to make? Well, if I'm if I'm to, if I'm I guess to, I'm I'm asking, are you making a, a uh, what are we gonna a have? Dish? Yeah, what, what are we, are we gonna have? Dinner? Well, if I'm really having a bad day, like my first food memory is after mass, big Catholic fa Italian Catholic family I come from, and my grandparents were still alive then, and they lived in a little house down on the south side, and we would go to mass, and then of course like good Italians, we would go to my grandmother's house, to Granny's house, and uh, she would, of course, put up the red, the red sauce. We don't call it gravy in Western Pennsylvania. We call it red, we call it, <laughs> we call it tomato sauce. Okay. But that tomato sauce had brajol and it's sausage and pork ribs, and it's, it cooks for six or seven. She probably got up about six o'clock and started it. So this was, this was two o'clock, we would show up at her house. And this is 1967, and I was six years old, and I would run into Granny's kitchen, and she was pretty, she didn't want people messing around in the kitchen, <laughs> but she gave us one slice of Wonder Bread, and we got to dunk it in the <laughs> tomato sauce. And so my first memory was a slice of Wonder Bread in tomato sauce on, after mass. And then we would just go out the backyard and break stuff. But if I'm in a bad place, I'll make a quick tomato sauce. I'll take olive oil, slice some garlic, some pepperoncino, little chilies. I throw, I just throw in some fresh, uh, some pomodoro, some uh, San Marzano tomatoes, some basil, a little bit of sugar, sometimes a little bit of wine. It cook it about a half an hour. And then I'm pretty much, sometimes I, I could probably just eat that. But the smell of garlic and olive oil and tomatoes and basil, that's, uh, a, that's my comfort food. So, but it I can cook. It smells like home. It smells like home. But I, you know, so when I'm really feeling adventurous, I can make a, a beef bourguignon that cooks for three Ooh. hours. You know, that's a ah. Ina Garden's recipe. That sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah, and I and if and if I had a bigger kitchen here, I would cook for you, <laughs> or you could have me over your house, and, you I, and I'll make a mess of your kitchen. That's the that's the deal. Yeah. that's the deal. Um, morning after Grace, we'll, we'll, we'll last question, pretty much. Um, what would you like? Since it's a newer play, many people don't know it. Yeah, they will once they come see it. Is there something specific that you'd like them to leave? having watched it, experiencing or thinking or... 
Uh, that's a great Something question. Like yeah. yeah, I have thought about that. Um, because now four years have passed since I did it at Florida Rep. And a lot has changed in my life since then. I've gotten older, for one thing. I'm closer to Angus's age. Angus is 70 in the show. Um, I think that for me, one of the guiding principles of this play is it's only over. It's only over if you quit. Mm. That's it. It's only over if you quit. Absolutely. If you give up, it's over. So it's our, it's, a, it's almost mandated that we as human beings keep trying. It's when cynicism overwhelms us that the world kind of stops and I think we just start kind of going away. Sure. So I think it's only over if you quit. And that's really what I think we're, that's really what the play's just about going. for me. Just yeah, keep just going. keep going. Just keep going because what these three people discover is that there's another way. Right. They learn to live another way. Old dog, new tricks. Yes, right. in this case, the old dog learns a bunch of new tricks. Well, that's wonderful. We're, mm -hmm. we're excited to have you back. We're excited for um, everyone to come and see Morning After Grace on the Wax Lax stage. And let me, can I add yes. this? 90 minutes. You will be home in time to watch the second <laughs> half of the football game. <laughs> No intermission. No intermission. 90 minutes. Go to the bathroom and <laughs> you, you'll be home in, 90, in, in an hour, that's, hour and a half. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Chris Claverly. We're so thankful. I'm so thankful that you spent some time with us and, and talking to us about the play. I know the cast is waiting. Yes. Um, and I just found out and I'm thrilled that you'll be with us next season yes. again. Yes, I can't so, wait. Um, very excited. We can't mention it because the season has not yet been That's announced. That's right. That's right. But uh, you'll, everyone will hear about it very, very soon. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, much success in the opening. And I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of Riverside Theater's Backstage Chat. Until next time, I'm Oscar Sales. <laughs>